members of council and represent other local representatives. Uh, they're going to be talking about local matters and why you should vote locally instead of maybe national parties. On the bench today, we have uh, Dr. Mel Semple, a Labour MEC. Um, Alistair Teddy from the Green Party on the end here. Mark Howell from Pool People. He's a lo uh, pool local pool councillor. Chris Wakefield, a Bournemouth councillor for the Conservative Party. And Zina Dion, pool councillor for the Conservative Party. Uh, they're each going to give a brief introduction about uh, their role maybe in the council and maybe why you should vote <coughs> for local policies over the, the national ones and why local politics is very important. Okay, so if we start with uh, Mel on the end here. Uh, first of all, to clarify, I'm not a member of the council. I will be I'm standing for council <coughs> um, in May. I'm women's officer for the local Labour Party. Um, why are local politics important? Because local politics is to do with the communi communities in which you live, and that's the place where you can have the greatest impact. National politics are important to do with economies and things, but local politics is about your own experiences, about your family's lives, about the education um, within <coughs> your local area, and about the environment in your local area. So it's really important if we want to create strong communities that you're actually politically active and aware about whatever it is within your um, community that is concerning you, that you want to make changes about. Those are the reasons why I think people should be involved at a very local level in local politics. Okay, next, uh, Nina, if you'd like to discuss maybe your role. Yes, I'm um, on pool council and um, just finishing our 12th year. First four years, very much sort of uh, understanding how it all works because it is a very complicated machine, um, the council. Second four years, chairing quite a few of the committees and understanding more how things work. Then the last four years, I've been on cabinet and I have responsibility. I started off with transportation and various things, but now I have... Um, our local economy, which includes tourism and businesses and skills and employment, and the natural environment, which obviously in also includes our beaches and open spaces, culture and learning, which is libraries and arts, and um, sort of recycling and waste collection, and um, sort of uh, in consumer protection services, so like stray dogs and various other things that people don't sort of often get involved in. But um, one of the things that's really, really important, um, why I think um, young people or younger people need to get involved, <coughs> is that things do get um, sort of taken over by people that are much older. And as an example, when we're looking at some of the decisions that we make in pool about how our seafront looks, and you know we've got you know, the best beaches in the country all along Sandbanks and, and we've got the harbour, when we make decisions about that, how that's going to look over the next 10, 15, 20 years, if we only have people that sort of um, are representing the much older age group who very often don't want change and don't want development, then the people who will be there in the future will miss out. And we need to engage and we need to get the involvement of, of younger people who can see that change can benefit a community. The other thing that's important is the economy. If we don't have a vibrant economy and we don't keep people, younger people, sort of in the area when they leave, like, you know, if you're leaving school or you're leaving university, where are you going to live? Where are you going to work? And part of our work on Pool Council is to make sure that we think ahead and that we have the skills and the employment to keep younger people in the area. And if we don't get your involvement, then we're making the decisions without, without you being there. And, you know, we don't know what's best for you. You know what your future wants or some of your sort of future plans are going to be. So that's why, you know, we think it's really important that you get involved. It's a very real um, situation and very real decisions that you need to be involved in. Thank you. Mark Howe, because your party, your uh, poor people is quite an interesting one I found. <coughs> Yes, um, I'm leader of Pool People. It was created about four years ago. Um, 
we are an independent party in the sense that you know we, we concentrate on recruiting uh, good people to stand in, in, in the elections and we stand under a, a banner of, of general policies but we don't have a whip, we don't tell how our councillors how to vote. <coughs> So, so, so they have independence within the system. And we feel that's really important. We have one of the most centralised political systems in, in, in the world. Um, we, we have a government which is conservative in Lib Dem, yet most of the councillors in, in, in the south of England anyway are conservative or Lib Dem. And uh, the, the, there's not a clear dividing line there. And what's happening in terms of austerity is that austerity is being pushed down the system and being implemented by councils. And the councils don't have enough independence to stand up against government and say, we're not so happy with some of these things. And the only solution to that is for, for people to invest in, understand who their local candidates are and, and, and what they stand for. And, 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 and vote for the individual rather than the party. And there are good people in, in the traditional parties, but it, they often lack the independence to act on behalf of their, their residents and constituents. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have Chris Wakefield uh, from Bournemouth Council. Uh, would you like to talk about your role maybe in the council? My role in the council? Well, I'm just a, I'm a backbencher. <laughs> Everyone says, oh, we're just a lowly backbencher, but actually not. Now, within Bournemouth Council, the backbencher is actually a real good in independent part of that machine. We're out there talking to good people like you. And it was interesting, as Ian was saying, it was the older person who really has the voice. <coughs> Got lots of shouty people who just shout about stuff all the time. And we always hear, there's the voices that always get heard. But the great thing within Bournemouth Council is you've got access to those local councillors. You know, our phone numbers are there, our addresses are out there, we've got emails. You are the, you are the people that influence us, the backbenchers, that can go and chat with the officers, the cabinet members, and direct access to the leader of the council and the deputy leader as well. So when people, it's just a backbencher, it is nothing at all. As, as a just. Interesting talking about party whips. Actually, I cannot remember in the last eight years since I've been a councillor when that party whip has been imposed. What we tend to have is a free vote. The, you know, within Bournemouth, yes, the majority is conservative. And actually, aren't we doing quite a good job? I mean, we've got a really good track record these last nearly eight years. The last four years, our government grant has reduced by 50%. Though we're still delivering growth within schools, still covering all those school places, we're still supporting our older people, where there's an absolute growth in the amount of older people that need support. And it just so happens that I chair our corporate parenting panel, which is our children in care, and unfortunately there is growth there as well. So you've got growth in two areas, um, but massive demands on our resources. But why should you get involved with the likes of me? It's because you are the future. My kids, I've got children 27, 25, 23, and a seven-year-old. You know, they are the ones, you are the ones, that are going to be taking forward Bournemouth. If you still live in Bournemouth or come back to Bournemouth, you've got to tell us what you want Bournemouth to look like in the future so that we can deliver that. Thanks. Okay, and then uh, <coughs> Alice Teddy on the end there for the Green Party. If you'd like to discuss maybe your role. Thank you. Um, I also am not a councillor at this moment in time. Um, I'll be standing in Queen's Park in Charminster. Um, I'm also going to be standing uh, in the national constituency of Bournemouth East for the Green Party. Um, I actually graduated from Bournemouth University nearly 20 years ago um, and I decided to uh, stay in Bournemouth, start a business and raise a family. Um, the, um, as a place to do that, Bournemouth is fantastic. There's a, a, a lot of opportunities here. Um, 
As far as the Green Party, um, we are hoping to gain councillors in uh, Bournemouth Borough Council um, for the first time in the upcoming elections. Uh, what we are seeking to do is uh, create a more socially fair situation in the country as a whole, but also starting locally. Um, we are uh, seeking to defend the environment um, and also support a uh, green economy as um, a, a means of generating economic revenue and growth but without the uh, social injustice and harm to the environment that, that is common in this day and age. Um, some things of note about uh, the, the Bournemouth area. Um, I, I love Bournemouth and I wouldn't consider raising my family anywhere else. Um, but there are pockets of severe social deprivation in this area. Um, parts of the Bosk and West Ward, for example, have the highest index of social depravity um, in the southwest, and it's in the top one percent in um, England overall. Uh, I think we need to raise the profile of social justice to help struggling families in in the current age of austerity, cuts to frontline services. Um, it's not easy for Bournemouth Borough Council given the central government cuts to the area. I think uh, Chris mentioned cuts to 50%, which was, I don't have the figures to hand, but it's in the region of 50 million, I think, on a, on, on a yearly basis that has just vanished from the local uh, government budget, mm. which means we need to prioritize where, where our resources are gonna go. Um, in terms of engagement with uh, a, um, a younger demographic. Um, the, the Green Party have become very popular in the 18 to 24 uh, bracket. We are either first or second in terms of support there. Um, something we would like to see continue. Um, our approach, we believe, can create uh, real lasting change and a fairer society. Um, and we need your participation because you're the future. You, many of you will be potentially voting for the first time in the upcoming elections and your vote counts now more than it ever has done. Thank you. We should now be taking any questions from the audience about any maybe concerns or anything they would like to bring up maybe that they don't understand about local politics. Uh, yes, uh, lady in the green top there. Um, thank you very much, it's Susan Chapman. Uh, Mr Wakefield, you talk of public engagement, but you know I, I engage my council, they're not listening, they do not want the Navitas Bay wind farm. I have asked you this question already today, and you've told me something about it, but it was nonsense. We need to listen to the IPCC reports, and I want to know why £63,000 <coughs> was squandered by uh, Bournemouth Fire Council on opposing Navitas when we need this clean energy. Thank you. <coughs> and yes, you, you've come to the council meetings on a number of occasions and asked very same or similar questions. Um, I'm going to say, as I said, I'm a backbencher. <coughs> as far as the Navitas Bay um, is concerned, it's, and it's very widely spread in the public domain that um, you know, Bournemouth Borough Council are not against um, the Green Party. We're not about looking and planning for the future. Um, we, our building program is around building houses and flats that are very eco-sensitive. With regards to the Navitus, um, we have been given some reports that say that that will have a detrimental effect upon the Jurassic coastline and therefore affect our tourism. And, and, I, and I, you know, we agree to disagree. There is always going to be two sides to something like this. Now we've got a lot of money, that an independent, and a <coughs> private company, you know, is going to make some money out of this Navitus wind farm. It's going to, by all accounts, it's not just about putting the windmills out there. 
It's actually about putting something on the land as well, and it's going to affect an area further along the coast. But the fear no, to Bournemouth is that it will have a detrimental effect upon our tourism industry, which is the mainstay, as well as the other stuff, to say that it will have an effect. So, but that, you know, that is where it is, and it is very well publicised in the public domain. And Abigail asks the leader of Bournemouth Council for his view on climate change, and all we have is an empty box. He does not accept the science, apparently. Excuse me, I don't think this is a forum to have what is an existing okay. argument oh. and just to, you know, issues that have been well-versed between Bournemouth and, and other parties, and I, I don't think it's fair on the rest of the students who need to ask questions. Okay. Fair uh, if we can keep the questions more about sort of whole uh, generic issues rather than very specific issues. Hey, any more? Anyone else with a question? Uh, you've got a chap in the back corner there. Uh, could more be done to raise the profile of council elections to maybe increase participation, particularly with young people? It's certainly the lesser known than European elections or general elections. Yes, <laughs> go for it. We would love you to be more involved in our local elections. And, you know, this is one of the things that I find really refreshing about coming to events like this. Um, is actually, we went to um, a presentation just the other day with Bournemouth University students cause, because we commission some of them each year to do um, projects that they're doing for their, their final, their dissertation. And we've looked at, um, say, the retail offer in Ashley Road and we've looked at um, what we've looked at this year is our tourism and branding. And what is amazing is the views and the um, ideas yeah. and the innovation that comes forward from you guys at university and, and some of the senior sort of classes in school. We're so ensconced in, in the business that we're having to do day to day and our, our day jobs as well, that we haven't got the time or the capacity and certainly haven't got the knowledge and skill to be able to come forward with some of those ideas. So we can't go to you and say, we need you, because guess what, we can, we can have you delivering leaflets and doing all the boring old stuff. But for you to come <coughs> to us and say, we'd like to help in your local election and to sort of revitalize our websites, provide an app, do anything that you feel you want to be involved in, we would be falling at your feet to have your ideas and, and involvement. Mm. And, and I echo that in Bournemouth as well. You know, it is a, it, it's always one of those things, it's up to you. The information is out there if you want to read it. You know, Bournemouth, you know, we have um, the websites, we've been telling people about, you know, first-time voters, you've got to go and register to vote. Make sure that you've registered to vote so that that one vote that people have died in the past for really does count. Because your vote could sway things. We were talking about Boscombe West. Uh, I represent Boscombe West and I have done for the last well, nearly eight years now. Um, I've lit, moved back to Boscombe 17 years ago in my family to grow up, you know, because it is the best place uh, to grow up in Bournemouth. Um, and it is very, very difficult to reach even the Boscombe electorate. And I'm out there with my teams, talking to people on a day-to-day -day basis, putting leaflets through doors. And then we go back and say, did you receive? Oh, no, I never received anything. Now, it went there. It got mixed up with the advertiser. It's actually about the information is there. It's about good people like you reading it and then coming back and challenging the likes of us and saying, actually, is that right? I want to know a little bit more. How can I get involved? How can my voice be heard? You know, amongst all that, all that fuzzy stuff and all those shouty people that are out there. Now, it really is about you getting involved with us because, as Ian said, we want you to come and be involved with us. You know, within Boscombe, I could get, get you out there and delivering stuff day in and day out and engaging with the electorate as a whole. Yes, I mean, that, that's kind of pushing the responsibility on, on you. And I think generally people need to, to invest more time in, in, in understanding um, what's being offered to them. But th there's a much bigger problem, which is, you know, apart from the fact that we shouldn't have local elections on general election day, that clearly doesn't help people focus on, on, on local elections. You know, the, what, what has happened is, is that, that local councils in this time of austerity are becoming delivery bodies for the for central government. 
Uh, they don't have the ability to make choices increasingly as to how, it spend, how, how they spend their money. Um, there are certain things councils have to do, they're ordered by government to do, and increasingly their budget it only goes on those things. So, so, so what is happening is that councils are turning into bodies which are, are just there to be efficient and to deliver services efficiently. So we, we, we can't give choices like, would you prefer bus services, better bus services or better libraries? Increasingly, we're having to say, we can't have either because the government, because they're, they're not, they're not, and this is what's going to happen after the next general election because there's mm. going to be massive austerity cuts. Uh, and, 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 and we need to give more power, the government needs to give more power to the localities so that when people go and vote, they, are, they have a genuine choice between different agendas and they can, they can relate their vote to the actions of, of the local politicians. Okay. I, I think we're talk it seems that we're talking about two very discrete areas here, the politicians and the electorate. And we're not asking the very fundamental question, where does power reside? And that's what you need to know. Power doesn't reside with politicians. Power resides with you, the electorate. And we must always remember that, that actually the power is in your hands to decide who can operate that power on your behalf and who can't. And you have every right to take that power away if you don't like what they're doing. So don't believe that it is up to politicians to put things in place for you. The power is in your hands. And that's what I, I want to tell you know all those who are coming up to vote for the first time. It's a very powerful thing, that vote. Mm -hmm. You know, people w won't be sitting on those council seats unless you exercise that power to those notions and ideas that you agree with. So I think we really do need to bring power into discussion and not think that politicians impose. They impose <coughs> because we allow them to. Thank you. Yes, um, I believe the original question was about um, how uh, a younger generation can find out more about local politics in, in Bournemouth. Um, there is, I, I've come across first hand some good public engagement from um, uh, students and ex-students, people who are um, running music nights in Bournemouth who are also taking uh, um, stalls to local university campuses to encourage people to vote and to increase uh, youth engagement. I think that's a, a brilliant example of uh, a reciprocal process where um, you can engage with uh, the local political establishment um, and you, you can spread the message and encourage people and be um, ambassadors, if you like, uh, locally. Um, there are other opportunities for engagement as well. Um, a lot of the local council wards operate forums which are specifically designed for the electorate to interact directly with the, the local political apparatus. Um, Boscombe Forum in particular has been very active recently. Very We've had um, the leader of Bournemouth Council uh, come to address the local people. Uh, it, it's a, the forums are a brilliant opportunity mm. for you to speak directly to your councillors and hold them to account and express what you require of them as well. Or just email us, or pick up the phone. We are accessible. Okay, we are mm. on to another question then. <coughs> okay, so I'm from the Arts University Bournemouth Students Union, um, and I was wondering, a question to all of you, is um, we've got one of the leading creative universities here, but um, the graduate retention isn't very high because of the money invested into the creative sector here. And I was just wondering um, what your thoughts were on that and um, what you're planning to do about that. Would you like to kick off on this one? I've got loads of stuff I could talk about, creative industries in Bournemouth, if you want me to. Um, thing about the Arts University, we're, we're um, 
we're sending out really great creative people, we're not retaining them in this town. Mm. Now, this town is basically for tourism. We have no other industries. The creative industries bring in so much money to this country. Why are we not cre creating creative spaces so that our graduates can come, stay in Bournemouth, and generate a different type of economy? Okay, right now. No, I absolutely <coughs> agree with you, and I think we should be doing everything to try and keep our creatives here and to have a creative industry <coughs> per se in Bournemouth. I absolutely agree with you. Just as an extension to that point, I think it would be interesting to look at the way that uh, the creative sector is actually fitting within the council in Bournemouth, and I'm not sure whether this is the case nationally, but it does seem to appear as though that art alone sits under a tourism bracket when really it's there's a massive arts university here with huge and maybe that might have something to do with why students don't feel like they want to stay here because they feel like they fall under the bracket of tourism and really artistic subjects aren't tourism they're a huge income stream for any any town or city here um, within the portfolios it's got to sit somewhere and to be honest, um, I don't think we've been in a position to create another um, cabinet member just for the arts because you know, it does sit there and the cabinet member that deals with that um, is very, very passionate about art, very passionate about the retention. And it's the one question that we keep asking ourselves year in, year out. How can we retain that fantastic, dynamic driven group of people from Bournemouth University, not just the arts, but the, you know, those people that come in. I never, I was, never got a university degree. I went to Bournemouth and Paul College just up the road there and got my BTEC diploma in catering. Um, so for me to retain those people, to help generate and re-energise our economy, Bournemouth is not just about tourism. We've got other um, was it financially driven economies as well but to have that creative economy here would be absolutely fantastic now within Boscombe we've created a space Arts by the Sea so we've got creative spaces there which is basically a table and a chair um, and you can come and rent space and then there's a, a meeting room and there's other stuff I don't think we go far enough with that we really don't go far enough so wouldn't it be good if you came and sat down with the likes of me and said actually this is what we want and then how can we make that happen I was watching something on television last night about the um, um, arts people in in the sort of 70s and 80s and and how they started off in London it was sort of a creative hub with some university that was in a, an old swimming bath I can't remember it was very late and I was still working on my computer at half 11 um, I was thinking gosh wouldn't it be great if we could get something like that with arts people coming together once they'd finished the university and start that creative hub to start our own dynamic explosion uh, for the future. So yeah, all for it, but sorry, not my bag, but I could do with a bit of help with it if somebody wants to come forward. Yeah, it does come under my portfolio and pool and art, it comes under culture, culture and arts. And we have, but you, you hit a raw nerve because I'm very aware of the growth in creative industries. And two or three years ago, we have an economic development team in Poole that's that sole remit is to try and generate um, business growth. And we bring in huge, we bring in millions and millions in growth funds for Poole out of that. But one of the areas that we really want to develop is the creative industries. Our, f our first little bit of actually making something happen. We went to Brussels and looked at what income streams, because we, councils don't have money, and I think that's what people have a perception that we've got money. We haven't, and that's because it, a lot of it goes on social care, and that's, you know, all the, all the stuff. But so, so what, we would, what we aspire to, unfortunately, th there's a gap in what we can deliver. But what we have got is a little, little sort of starting point. We've got a pop-up shop in Poole High Street specifically for creative industries to come and show off their wares and test the market and I would actually recommend if you haven't been there go down and have a look because at the moment it's got 
a pop down shop and everything's reversed and it's it's fantastic but it is all about developing new growth in creative industries we've got other pockets around but it is grossly inadequate and that is something that we are working on but you know we i'm not going to put my hands up and say we've we've done all these great things because we've done little pockets but my goodness me we're aware that it's a growth industry and we want to be there mm. I think you had a point to bring up. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm declaring interest because I've got a master's in, in, in photojournalism, documentary photography. But in, in most politicians are not creative people. They tend to be detailed people. But, you know, sitting in, they, they tend to like sitting in meetings and looking at detailed documents. You know, I, I kind of hate that stuff. But, but. But the, the, re, the reality is that, that if the, there's relatively small people who are creatively minded in, within the population, and they, they can't just sit there and say, please give us that. You know, they have to get involved in the system and, 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 and get elected and, and, and get involved in organizations and try and change those organizations for the better. This area is quite traditional. You know, it has a lot of people move here because they like the, 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 the sunshine and the outdoor activities. Uh, but for it to grow, it needs real investment in the creative industries, not pop-up shops. We have a massive regeneration area that's in danger of just being built out with housing. But it could be a fantastic creative area in the manner that kind of Bristol and Brighton managed to create. But, but politicians don't don't tend to get the big picture. They look at detail, and that, that's, no, we, 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 the, we, we don't even have the creative industries in the pool's plans. And, you know, it's just most, I'm afraid most politicians don't get it. Can I just come back? No. I mean, I do have an interest here. My, my son happens to be an international artist, went away to London, came back to Bournemouth and is situated here, helps out at the Watts at once in a while. So he's well versed about creative industries and advised government and such on it. This is an opportunity for Bournemouth to create a new economy. It is. What you know? What are we doing? This is such an opportunity to keep these great creative people here. Now, cre the creative industries is so wide. It's not about just having the watercolour on the wall. You know, there's loads of different stuff that's happened. It's very, very attractive. It changes the whole sense of Bournemouth, just the demographics will change. You know, it makes Bournemouth more vibrant and it makes us not so reliant on tourism so we have to put a million pounds worth of palm trees on the beachfront. <laughs> we could have given it to the creative industries and really started something off. <laughs> Sorry, but that's how I feel about it. We haven't yeah. put a million quid's worth of palm trees on the seafront. Well, you know hey. what There's an extra point at the back here and I'll come to you. Can, can I can I just quickly uh, come I back? Just let this gentleman speak. Go on. Then. Um, what, what I'm hearing here, uh, I, I think, is fantastic because what I'm hearing from a lot of the, the people here is that we can see and we can all see that arts and creativity is the focus and that it will mean economic regeneration locally and nationally. Actually, and what I want to ask that the. the the Conservative Party here is, you can see that, why are you part of a party that doesn't actually fund that? We heard this week that how many millions of pounds are coming into Dorset for various things, but none of it's coming in for the things that will actually make a difference. Uh, can I say, maybe if you ask that to the MPs this afternoon... Mm. No, but it, you're part of that party, Christopher. Um, I am, yeah. uh, with a small p. Uh, we're talking politicians. I represent... Uh, the people in Boscombe, my friends, my next door neighbours, the electorate, you know, as far as me engaging with the National Party, mm. um, I do that at a very, very low level. So, you know, things like that, you would ask me, I would then sit down and t with Tobias and we'd have a very frank discussion about mm. it, believe you me. So, so but you've you got the opportunity this afternoon. Mm. But the one thing in Boscombe, you know, and we are very at all, and, you know, it is still, unfortunately, and in that area of deprivation, but we are working so hard to get out of that town. We are encouraging artists to come into Boscombe um, through our local improvement fund. Uh, we, we furnished um, a local artist um, to paint the wall behind Iceland, which is absolutely fantastic piece of wall art. And there's other wall art around Boscombe as well. Rumelia Lane, we've got 
three artist studios down Rumelia Lane, there is this explosion of art. We've got um, word. We've got lots of people coming in and doing lots of words and stuff like that. And, and it's just, for me, yes, I'm, I'm not a politician at the end. Everyone says, oh, you, 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 you're a, a conservative um, politician. I am a member of the general public. Ten years ago, somebody said, Chris, you're quite gobby. Why don't you go out there and be gobby on our behalf? And that is what I've had the opportunity to do. And likewise with my other two councillors in Boscombe, we do listen and we do sit down and our position is to influence. And so we have got this start of that arts revolution. And I called it an arts revolution not so long ago in the, in the press. We have got arts revolution and we just need more artists to come and not go off to London, not go off to America, you know, to stay in Bournemouth, in Boscombe, we need to, to help something to come that to arts. Though. Yes. Because because that's exactly the, the, the thing. I mean we could we could spend hours just talking about how the government funds and, and how towns grow. But in a in a very sort of in a nutshell, the we as councils we have to bid for funds from government. And if you haven't got a good infrastructure in place, the government doesn't give you the funding. And the, the millions that we've won recently <coughs> In, in Poole, and it is very much working with Bournemouth and, and Dorset, is to have a much better routes into Poole and Bournemouth in the conurbation. And we, the councils are there to enable, and we try and make growth happen, but we're not there to build a building and make, you know, make cottage industries grow. We're, we're trying to facilitate, but it's a partnership working, and we need to work together. But I, I, I see our job, and I, you know, I may be wrong, but I see our job in, from my perspective is that we are there to try and make a thriving economic hub in which creative industries like any other industry in, and business can grow. And that is not a simple thing. You know, there are many, many, many different dimensions to that. And that would be much too big for this sort of debate at the moment. But, that, but that's, that's really what our role is. You've only just got a point here on the end. There's a, an issue that I've asked dozens of councillors and MPs when I've had the opportunity to ask them, and it's a huge issue that affects probably everyone on this side of this room, and that's the issue of the appalling standards of student housing. Student housing standards are absolutely terrible in Bournemouth. The rents are high, they're infested with mould, the estate agents are bad, and the landlords, to be quite honest, are much better. I've asked every party None of them have given an answer. What's your answer to the problem of student housing in Bournemouth? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, <coughs> I would say that this is this kind of national issue. It's not just students. It's lots of people on low incomes are living in uh, properties which uh, are basically poorly maintained by landlords. You know, it's partly due to the, the ridiculous policy that the government has of promoting buy-to-let properties we get small landlords who are trying to make money out of property we need to go back to a system where yeah on, on the student elements but we basically need to have laws which which require landlords to maintain their property to to uh, to good standards that are inspected that you you don't have to pay rent if 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 if, if the property doesn't meet that standard uh, and, 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 and basically we need proper regulation of the properties. In terms of cost, you know, clearly it, it's very difficult because, uh, and, and I, I think that's why a lot of students go to the north of England because, uh, because it's cheaper up there. But, but you know, that, that's a very th difficult thing to deal with and perhaps can only be dealt with by students living together in larger numbers mm -hmm. like I used to do. <laughs> if, if I could, this, um, the standard of housing in the area has been discussed at the Boscombe Forum in quite a bit of uh, detail. Um, there are a lot of students who, who live in Boscombe um, and some of the housing is really, really quite substandard. Uh, one thing that was discussed it's was small, the... Small proportion of the housing, not as much as it used <laughs> to be. One of the things that was discussed was... Um, uh, the possibility of introducing a selective licensing scheme for landlords, 
which would mean that properties would be subject to inspection and landlords could have their licence uh, suspended if they're found not to have uh, a, a basic standard uh, that's adhered to. I, I think that would help what you're describing. If I can come in on that. Sorry, no, no, oh, we're going over there, are we? Oh, sorry. I don't know what the role of the university is in overseeing your accommodation either. I don't know whether there is some responsibility on them to check out the types of accommodation that they're placing the students. Maybe that could be something that's firmed up. But I do know that nationally, the Labour Party are, do want to do things about, if you like, rogue landlords, going back to how they were in the 70s, and about um, the state of properties and the living conditions. So even though that doesn't, and I understand, address you specifically as a student, we do have things nationally that will automatically include you in that. So it's not specific students, but I would ask the question, what do BU do about looking the oversight of the properties that they might be advertising for for student lets and I maybe you know you can put some pressure on the university to make sure that they they do something with those landlords that they allow to make money from you not specifically with students low income housing is very different to student housing yeah. i'm not paying low income rent no. i'm paying a stonking amount of money <laughs> for my rent for a sub i lived in a house last year that had no heating or hot water for the whole year. And can I, I ask how you got that house? Where I did you find it? I went to that? An, a local estate agent right. who yes. rented me this property. I threatened to take these people to court. They deleted my emails. I went consistently into Enfields every day for two months, and these people ignored me. The, I have a personal problem with student housing. Just, yes, I'm know. declaring an interest in student housing. There is. It, it's an endemic problem. I've spoken to the Student Union, I've spoken to Bournemouth University, and ironically, the only people who are actually doing something about it is a website called Move'em. And I'm sure we've all heard of Move'em. They're a, a, a website which ranks properties. BU has BU lettings now, mm. so that we can go there, and the, the yeah. properties they provide are significantly better. Right. But it's, yeah. it's, the problem so much is, is, is with the landlords, who are charging 36% higher interest rates on student housing, and an administration fee than they are on private housing. Mm. I, I would also suggest that you could, you could contact your local council because we can intervene because the local authority, regardless of what type of property you're in, the local authority does have a role to play in, in making sure that people are living in standard, you know, not below standard accommodation. We tried to build a, um, with, with the university and, and the developers um, student accommodation at Talbot Village and it goes back completely full cycle to the very very first question which is about how important is your vote and how important it is to get your voice heard. It was, it was scuppered by people that didn't want student accommodation in their area and again rightly or wrongly that's, that's another debate but you know we didn't have the voice of the young people and I wasn't involved in that particularly but it, it just means that there was a lost opportunity for student accommodation because of people not wanting it in their neighbourhood. And, you know, like I said, that's, that's another big debate, but making sure that your voice is heard, and we need to make sure that you, you get notice when these sorts of applications are coming in so that you can make representation. I mean, it's directed yeah. at, at, at Bournemouth, really. You know, there is a minimum home standard. That is enforceable by the local authority. Yes, we were talking about uh, various schemes that could come forward with regards to that. The local authority are already doing it. Within Boscombe, we inspected over 1,500 units of accommodation. I think it was about, there was a number of those units of accommodation that needed improvements done. Those landlords were issued with notices to improve. I believe there was one landlord who didn't do that, so we took them to court. So court is always an option. To hear that you we're living in accommodation without heating or hot water is absolutely awful. Anybody that comes to see me or my war colleagues or any of the councillors that I'm aware of in Bournemouth with an issue such as that, we would have got our officers to go down there, undertake an inspection and that process would have started. Nobody upon nobody, no matter what level of, uh, of income that they have, should be living in such dire, dire conditions. It is just not acceptable in this day and age. And we will. We will go out there and myself, I'm not going to tell you the, the name of the, the very large landlord um, whom, 
who is a lot, who who is, who whose whose son is a lot taller than me, um, and I had discussions very crick neck looking up at him. Um, yeah, I'll go down and have a little chat with people like that because if people are living in, in, in conditions that they shouldn't do, yeah, I'll take that direct action, as I'm sure lots of other councillors would do on your behalf. We, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, there was a question at the back here. Yeah, I was just going to follow on from the housing, like the water and heating issue is very common, and it is a really bad letting agent from uh, what I know anyway. But it's like also the housing price for students. It's like you're charging so much for per student per like per student in per house. It's like a hell of a lot more money than what it would be on a standard rent. If you get what I mean? Is if it yeah. wasn't a student house, you're paying a lot more for being a student. So, we had a question over here in the end. Um, I was just going to pick up on my point you said earlier in the fact that you say you weren't a politician. Young people like change. Young people are very, will do something if we see it worthwhile. We want change. So saying to a group of young people that I can't actually influence my party that much isn't going to do a lot to increase political participation in the local area. I think, I think what, um, what we need to, I don't, I just think to get young people involved, we need to see a change happening. And we always come against, up against the barriers of, oh, it's a national issue. I understand it may be a national issue, but there should be something local councillors should do. Because if you want us to vote for you, then you have to deliver a service to us, because that's what you're there to do. What I was trying to say, and obviously uh, I didn't get it across, is that yes, I can, nas I can influence our MPs. I can ring Tobias up, I can sit down with him, I can have those discussions. As far as me being influenced locally by a, the Conservative um, Party, that mechanism, you know, I will make decisions based upon the information that I have got based upon the evidence that I have got. I'm not going to have somebody tell me what I should and I shouldn't be voting about. You know, that, that's for one. So that, as far as that influence, it was them trying to influence me rather than me trying to influence them. I can go and, as I said before, I can sit in with the leader of the council. I can influence the cabinet members. I can um, you know, speak to good people like yourselves. I mean, a recent thing um, in, in Boscombe, right? Uh, a resident came to us and said, actually, uh, there's a load of people getting parking tickets on a bank holiday Monday uh, when they really shouldn't be because the, the officers are coming around and enforcing it. Quite right and proper. That's daft, isn't it? You know, the, the, the parking enforcement was there because of the amount of traffic going across. It doesn't happen on bank holiday Monday. I went along, spoke to the officers, spoke to the cabinet member, and now that parking restriction has been lifted on a bank holiday Monday. So we can influence stuff just by somebody telling us something's a bit daft or something needs to change. And likewise with national politics as well. If there is something that you feel passionate about, and you can if you want to, sorry I got me back to this side of the room because I was chatting to you, um, you can go and sit down with your local MP and, and express a view to that MP. They are there, they are accessible. It's not just about me picking the phone up to speak to them, which I can do, but it, wouldn't it be good if you sat there and said, actually, Mr MP or Mrs MP, you know, I've got these problems. I've got problems about national rents, about the rents for students. It's a free market economy. Can't you do something about that? Because we're all getting ripped off. We only get a certain amount of money, and that money is just getting stretched and stretched and stretched. Can't you look at do coming out and doing something and putting a bill through Parliament to cap rents within the UK as far as student as accommodation is concerned. That is something that he can do. What we can do locally is just slightly different. So I'm sorry if I, I, I didn't get my point across um, as eloquently as I should have done. Two more quite brief points, yeah. I think we've got um, one. 
just to yeah. say that if you want, it's a two-way street. I know in the Labour Party we have policy forums. So if you join the local Labour Party, you can feed into your local policy forum with the representative that goes to the southwest in this place. And then you can have a some sort of influence on policy. So there are things that you can do. And lots of things are governed at a national level, which, you know, people hands are tied. But if you want to have an influence on that process, that then trickles down to the local, then you need to get involved in those local politics and get your voice heard and get your changes through. Yeah, I don't just to end. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Fine. Well, he's yeah. Yeah. So very, very brief. Yeah, yeah. very, very brief points. Okay. Yeah, it's just about organisation, change in organisation. People that like are organised don't like change. People that are organised join organisations. So <laughs> politics universities, they're, they're all stuff full of people who, who like organisations. So if you like change, you've got to get in there and find your space where you can make that change happen. It, it's, if you're a change-oriented person, you've got to find that space. You can't expect it to be delivered to you because the organised people are in power. And I've just had uh, to to, buy us, just to change the legislation uh, with regards to drug there. stuff in Boscombe as well because they make the drug rehabilitation <laughs> centres, and that's something that he's doing. It brief. In, it's one last have a point. Forum, it's very important to have the voice of, of young people, and the, vo and the, and the, the um, youth forum actually feeds directly to Cabinet. We get a report. We, we know the, the issue, or we hope no, we don't know the issues of everybody, obviously, but we, we, we hear the issues that are raised. But one of the things that's really important to know is a lot of the work that we do does have a direct influence or impact on you but it's very much behind the scenes, like creating jobs, creating that, that um, growth to make sure that when you leave university, at least you might have an option to stay around in the, in the Bournemouth and Pool area. So that there is a lot that directly does impact, but it's not actually tangible that you can put your hand on and say you want to get involved. Some of these things go on for years. It took us 20 odd years to get a new bridge in Pool. It takes, you know, the, the big areas of regeneration are taking years. They're, they're very complex issues, but you know, direct things. If you've got anything, come and see us. Okay. okay yeah, we are afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I'd like to thank all the members of the panel for coming along and uh, making all of their points well heard and discuss and answering the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.